next one, who is, which is from Craig Martin on Paleocene latitude of the Koshan Lad arc. arc and it initiate, indicates multi stage Indian Eurasian collision. Whether I pronounced that all right, I have no idea, but I'm sure I'll find out. All right, let me just share my screen. Can you all hear me and see see my title slide? Yeah, we can. All right, wonderful. Well, I can. <laughs> Great, that's that's enough for me. Uh, <laughs> no, I I hope you can all see it. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be here or here in 2D today to present to you um, some of our paleomagnetic results from the Western Himalaya, uh, which we believe indicate that the India-Eurasia collision was actually a multi-stage process rather than a single stage continent-continent uh, collision event. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that this is the work of, of myself and a number of co-authors. I'm a student um, of Professor Oliver Yagutz at MIT. Um, and the work was supported by the NSF but, and also some internal MIT funding. Um, so the closure of oceans and subsequent continental collisions are, are of course a fundamental component of the Win Wilson cycle and, and are, are important in, in plate tectonics. And our most spectacular example to study the processes involved with continental collision is of course the Himalaya Karakoram Tibet origin in, in South, South Asia. Um, so I'm showing you a map here of um, the sort of western half of, of the Himalaya. It's, it's a, a kind of tectonic map. Um, and the closure of the Near Tethys Ocean, which once separated India and Eurasia, is now preserved along the, the narrow suture zones which transect the Himalayan belt. They're shown in thick black lines on this map. Um, and so in the central and eastern Himalaya, India and Eurasia are separated from each other um, along just one suture zone, the Sangpo suture zone. Um, but in the western Himalaya, the tectonic sort of arrangement is different. So there, India and Eurasia are separated from one another um, by the remnant of a, of a Jurassic to Cretaceous age intraoceanic subduction system. Um, which is now sandwiched between the Indian and Eurasian continents. And so in the Western Himalaya, um, the intraoceanic terrain is separated from India by the Indus suture zone and from Eurasia by the Shayak suture zone. So the timing of collision is well constrained on the Northern Indian margin to, to the Paleocene between 55 and uh, 60 MA um, by the arrival of Arc, volcanic arc detritus into Indian margin sediments uh, and some other proxies. Um, but the metamorphic response to collision in, in, in Tibet is not really observed until the, the, the mid Eocene, so around 40 to 45 MA. Um, and so uh, the age of the Shayak suture zone, which separates the Coast Ladakh arc from Eurasia, is still disputed. So that has been argued to be as young as 40 million years old to as, mo as old as over 80 million years old. And so the differences in how we interpret the ages of, of collision events and the ages of these structures has allowed two conflicting collision models for the India-Eurasia collision to persist. So in the, in the standard model, the India-Eurasia collision is considered to be a single stage continent-continent collision in which India moved rapidly northwards across the Near Tethys Ocean and impacted the southern margin of Eurasia in the Paleocene. However, plate reconstructions show that there's uh, thousands of kilometers of separation between India and the Eurasian continent at this time. And so accordingly, it's been interpreted that there has to have been a, a large extent of India that's now that's now lost, um, and up to two up to an, an above two thousand kilometers of, of north south extra Indian continent, which is referred to as Greater India. And so the alternative model that's been suggested is that in the Near Tethys Ocean south of Eurasia, a and in the interoceanic subduction system, which is pre preserved in uh, primarily in the Western Himalaya, was active at a near equatorial latitude um, until it collided with the northern margin of India in the Paleocene. And then final continental collision in this model 
did not occur until 40 to 45 MA after the closure of, um, of an ocean basin, which, which has been called the Shiroda Ocean Basin. So this, this multi-stage collision model is attractive because it reconciles the separation between the Indian and Eurasian continents at the time of collision with the amount of crustal shortening that's been observed in, in, the, in the Himalayan belt. And also the, the activity of a second subduction system, which we're calling the Trans-Tethian subduction zone, uh, south of the Eurasian margin throughout the closure of the near Tethys has been argued as a, as a potential explanation for the rapid motion, the anomalously rapid motion of India uh, during the late Cretaceous. So crucially, each of these models makes a distinctly different prediction about the location of remnants of this trans tethian subduction zone um, in the late Cretaceous and early Paleocene time. So the single stage collision model requires that this intraoceanic subduction system had accreted onto the southern margin of Eurasia long before uh, the arrival of India. Whereas, and so it should be situated at a paleo latitude of greater than 20 degrees north throughout late Cretaceous and Paleocene time. Whereas in the multi-stage collision scenario, the intraoceanic subduction system would be expected to be at a more southerly paleo latitude near the equator until it collided with India in, in, in the Paleocene. So we set out to, to um, resolve between these two conflicting models by doing a paleomagnetic study of the Kardam volcanics in, in Ladakh in uh, Northwest India. So the Kardam volcanics are a suite of rhyolitic volcanic rocks that are the extrusive equivalent of the Kirsten Ladakh arc batholith, which is this intraoceanic terrain in the Western Himalaya. Um, and so, and we studied the upper section of these, of these volcanics because um, the presence of ash horizons and, and sediments interbedded with the, the rhyolite volcanics allowed us to uh, get a, a good estimation of the paleo horizontal. So these rocks are, are, are tilted towards the north. And so in the south, the Cardam volcanics are bounded by the plutonic rocks of the, of the batholith. And then in the north, they're bounded by the structures of the Shark Suchi zone. So that's the, the sort of structure that separates the arc from the Eurasian margin. So we did some, some precise uranium led zircon geochronology um, from throughout our sampled section. And we were able to constrain the age of our volcanic rocks to between 61.6 and 66.1 million years. So this puts it just before the collision, uh, that just before collision began to affect the northern Indian margin, um, and actually the age range overlaps with some of the first uh, ophiolite abductions onto the onto India in in, in Pakistan. So the forty four point five MA age range is long enough, in theory, to average the the paleosecular variation of the geodynamo, um, and the, the age of these rocks is, should help us resolve between the two models because it constrains the location or will help us constrain the location of the intraoceanic subduction system shortly prior to the, India, the collision initiation on the Indian margin. So for our paleomagnetic sampling, you, I'm, I'm assuming most of you will be quite familiar with this, we sampled five to 13 oriented cores drilled from individual volcanic flows at each of our sites. Uh, we demagnetized those samples using alternating field and thermal demagnetization techniques at the uh, MIT Paleomagnetism Laboratory. And then we use principal component analysis um, to isolate individual magnetic components from our, from our samples. And uh, a combination of the unblocking temperature and hysteresics experiments shows that the, the primary carrier of magnetization in our, in our samples is single domain or pseudo single domain magnetite which are good paleomagnetic recorders. Um, so our results, as you can see here, define two antipodal populations. This is the results in geographic and tilt corrected coordinates. We have 18 uh, site mean orientations. And these uh, antipodal populations, when plotted against stratigraphy, 
um, resolve all, all but one of the expected uh, magnetocrons for the, for the age range of, of our study. And so the presence of these expected magnetic reversals is a strong indication that the uh, magnetization of our samples is, a, is not a post-depositional overprint, um, because such an overprint would, of course, be expected to, over, to completely obliterate the, the reversal record. Um, to further confirm that our results are primary, uh, we conducted conglomerate tests at the top and base of our sample section. So this is an example from the uh, test at the top of the section uh, on the left here. And as you can see from the distribution, so in a, in a conglomerate test, the, you would expect class magnetization directions to be randomly distributed um, because that's how they should be from, from being transported um, and then redeposited. Um, and as you can see on the left, our class magnetization directions are indeed randomly distributed and we confirm this uh, using a Watson test for randomness, which, which passes in all cases. So because we're confident that the magnetic, the magnetization directions of our, of our samples are the primary record from when the volcanic rocks formed, uh, we can use them to determine a paleomagnetic pole for the Cardin volcanics and therefore the trans tethian subduction zone shortly prior to the india eurasia collision. And the uh, uncertainty angle of our, um, of our paleomagnetic pole is within the acceptable uh, constraints of Dean and Natal 2011. And so this pole allows us to constrain the Coast and Ladakh arc and, and therefore the trans tethian subduction system to a paleo latitude of 8.1 plus or minus 5.6 degrees north in, uh, in the time range between 61.6 and 66.1 million years ago. This paleo latitude is, is, in our view, significant because it allows us to, constrain, to, to choose between the two uh, conflicting collision models. Our results are uniquely compatible with a multi-stage collision model because they place the intraoceanic subduction system significantly south of Eurasia at, uh, the, at, the, in the, at the Cretaceous Paleocene boundary. So that's our plate reconstruction showing the coast and Ladakh arc, um, and it's positioned between uh, 600 and 2,300 kilometers south of the contem contemporaneous Eurasian margin. And so the presence of this oceanic plate between India and Eurasia after 50 to 55 MA explains the, uh, explains the difference between the amount of convergence expected in the, in the India-Eurasia collision and the amount of observed crustal deformation in the Eurasian and Indian margins. Um, our results also put a firm upper boundary on the maximum size of Greater India to less than 900 kilometers. So here are our results again, presented against the um, plate reconstructions from Van Hinsberg et al. Uh, 2019. Um, and this black line is the predicted paleo latitude of the intraoceanic subduction system using the double subduction model of Yaguz et al. 2015. So this is modeling the double, uh, a double subduction system. And as you can see, our results are in good agreement with that, with that prediction. And also, a multi-stage collision model is in good agreement with the available plate reconstructions. So we believe that our, debate, our data supports a multi-stage India-Eurasia collision model in which first, India, sorry, India collided with an intro, the intraoceanic subduction system at 50 to 60 MA, and then continued to move northward while the Shiroda Ocean Basin subducted beneath Eurasia before finally colliding with Eurasia in the continent-continent collision at 40 to 45 MA. That's 15 million years later than is generally assumed. So this collision chronology is well preserved in the Western Himalaya, where the Indus Sutra Zone records the first stage of collision between the intraoceanic Coast and Ladakh arc and the northern margin of India. This Sutra Zone is well constrained to 50 to 55 million years. 
So final India-Eurasia collision then it therefore occurred along the Shyok Sangpo Suchi zone, not the Indus Sangpo Suchi zone. And it's constrained in the Western Himalayas to between 40 and 45 MA by the chemical changes in, in, in the Ladakh Baffle. So with that, I will, uh, I'd like to thank again my co-authors and, and, and sponsors. Um, I'd specifically like to thank uh, my undergraduate field assistant, Jade Fisher, who was incredibly helpful in the field. And, and also my hosts, Sewang Dorje and Stanzin Kando, who, who graciously accommodated us in, in Ladakh during our field season. So with that, thank you. I'll, I'm happy to take questions. Um, and if you're more interested in this work and, and don't get to ask a question, um, the, it is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences now. So you, you can find it there. And I'm also happy to answer any questions by email. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Craig. So has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask? Yes, I have some questions. Okay. Uh, did you consider paleo latitude from the Himalaya? So if you look at the paleo latitude from the Himalaya, it suggests that uh, the Ladakh is already a part of the uh, Himalaya at 60 MA. So we must uh, collide before 60 MA. So, sorry, which, which, which measurement are you, are you talking to? You cut out a little bit, I, 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 I missed you. Yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of paleomagnetic data from Tetsuki Himalaya. So the paleo latitude at 60 MA is, is the same as the, as the data from Nadak. So that means they are already together so, before so you, 60 MA. You, you mean the, the work from Pakistan? No, so, so not from Pakistan, from Tethys Himalaya. From the Tethys Himalaya. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm mis yes. misunderstanding. Okay, so the, the, the data from the Tethys Himalaya is, um, well, that's, that's sort of been interpreted to show that India, that Greater India extended hugely, you know, the, the, the Greater India extension was large, but I'm, I'm not sure of any Tethys Himalaya data that would constrain the location of the of the Ladakh system, I would argue that our data is from, you know, from igneous rocks. And, for, you know, I, I see, I, the, you're right, there is a, there is a problem in, the, in this sort of field because we have some data from the Tethys Himalaya, which is primarily sedimentary originated paleomagnetic data, which puts a large extent on greater India. Um, whereas, and our data conflicts with that, but I would argue that um, the a, a smaller extent of Greater India did not only agrees better with the paleomagnetic data, particularly particularly from from our study, but it also matches the amount of underthrusting beneath the Eurasia. So the the seismic imagery beneath Tibet shows that the Indian continent is only subducted by 600 kilometers. So I, I think it's quite hard to imagine why. Um, it's, it's quite hard to see how you lose over a thousand kilometers of continental crust um, in, the, in underthrusting. And so I, I think it's, it's important to now look at that paleomagnetic data and ask, well, why is it giving us latitudes that are so far north? It's possible that those sediments formed as, you know, in association with this intraoceanic system. At, at least that's what I would argue. And also, I think the, the paleolithic that you, you use for NASA has some problem. Because uh, okay. uh, a lot of paleomagnetic data suggests that the southern Eurasia, the Lhasa block is located at something about 15 degrees, not 30 degrees. So, I mean, so we compared it to the. the that means the, the, the southern Eurasia of... is much. You're right. So, you're right. If, if Eurasia is Sorry, you further further. south, then, then it, it, it makes it harder to distinguish the Kirsten and Ladakh arc from Eurasia. So, we're, we're comparing our results to the plate reconstruction of Van Hinsbergen et al., which incorporates much of the most reliable, in fact, as far as I'm aware, all of the reliable paleomagnetic data from, from Tibet, so that, that, from Lhasa particularly. So, so that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the latitude that, that we're comparing our data to. 
Okay. Thank you very much for the question. There's another one from Connell in the chat mm -hmm. who said, how do you decide the hemisphere? It also It's also consistent with greater India with large rotations, dot, dot, dot. Is, yeah, that's that's referring to the the um, the the. You, are you referring to the the data from the Tethys Himalayan now, or the or the data I just presented? I have no idea. So it's so just... we we know that so we 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 are we know the hemisphere because um, of the inclination direction, right? And and these rocks have not been rotated 180 degrees from from the original orientation. I, I guess my question, how do you know that? How do we, so, well, I, I mean, the, because they form, uh, you know, they're, they're still the right way up, right? And if you have twisted them around completely, like there just isn't structural support for that in, in, the, in the field. You know, you can follow this unit across tens of kilometers of, of the region we, we work in in Northwest India. And it, it you know, to, to rotate the whole Cardan volcanics by that much would, would be, you know, it, it doesn't make sense in, in the field, I would argue. 